Next, we'll call upon the next speaker, Dr. Rekha Kuryan, who is the director of Joseph Nursing Home, and she's well known to us. She's our OXI president. She's going to talk on near test to evaluate ovarian function, when, what, and how. Over to Dr. Rekha Kuryan. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I must thank the organizers of Trendo and the Endocrine Society of India for having included OXI in its program. Um, we as gynecologists are quite interested in endocrinology, especially uh, because of the practice of infertility and we deal with so many of the hormones. So uh, we are quite happy that way to uh, collaborate with Endocrine Society of India. Um, Trouble here. Yeah, so the topic that I've given, uh, I've been given today is ovarian function tests, when, what and how. Uh, the female workforce since the 1960 advent of oral contraceptive pill, the woman has got released from her strings at home. And moreover, driven by the improving education of women, and their entry into the workforce, there has been a delay in the onset of reproductive function of the female. And this has led to a lot of problems for us uh, when women want to conceive. If you look at fertility, the population studies show that there is a reduction of female fertility and the chance of not conceiving a first child within one year increases from under 5% in women in their early 20s to approximately 30% in the age group of 35 years and older. However, there is a substantial variation in the decline of reproductive capacity with age. And therefore, we need to identify the women of relatively young age with clearly diminished ovarian reserve as well as women around the mean age at which natural fertility on average is lost, that is about 41 years, but have still adequate ovarian reserve. So you, here you can see that ovarian aging uh, is quite uh, different. Um, it can be, subfertility can occur even at 21 years of age and it may go on till 41. If you look at sterility, again, it can occur as early as less than 30 years of age and go on up till 40. Cycle irregularity can occur at any time and similarly, menopause can start as early as less than 40. If you take the average, menopause would be around the age of 51. Cycle irregularity start around the age of 45 and sterility and infertility on the average will be around the age of 30. So this explains how there is a wide variation from individual to individual and therefore we cannot just say that a woman of 40 or for even 44 will not conceive on her own. But how do we assess this? Now what is ovarian reserve? It is defined as the number and the quality of follicles left in the ovary at any given time. Now many of us uh, deal with IVF and the probability of a live birth obtained through IVF treatment clearly decreases after the age of 35. So these are infertile women and then we are offering them IVF and after the age of 35 we know the quality and the number of oocytes are less. Over the past two decades we have the so called ovarian tests which have been studied for their ability to predict the outcome of IVF in terms of the oocyte yield that we get at uh, oocyte retrieval and then again the occurrence of pregnancy which would depend upon the quality of the oocyte. Now the assessment of ovarian reserve it is considered normal when we try to stimulate with exogenous gonadotrophins and it will result in about 8 to 10 follicles and we will re re retrieve a corresponding number that is about 8 to 10 healthy oocytes at follicle puncture. 
With such an yield, the chances of producing a live birth through IVF are considered optimal. So our aim is to get about 8 to 10 oocytes. So in this group, we need to identify the women who are at high risk of a poor response to ovarian stimulation or a very low probability of becoming pregnant through IVF. So in this cohort, we need to identify the ones who are at high risk to get a poor response with the same amount of gonadotrophins. Those who will produce enough oocytes to have a good chance of becoming pregnant even if the female age is advanced. So we see women of 39, 40, 41 who have a good chance of having large number of oocytes even though her age is advanced. And because of this, if we can identify these women, the management can then be individualized. We can change the stimulation doses and the period of stimulation. The treatment schemes can be adjusted. Also, we can counsel the women with a poor prognosis, although she is only 32 or less. We can counsel her against IVF treatment to go for donor oocyte, or you may refuse to accept her in the cycle, or by indicating to certain women the necessity of early initiation of uh, in, uh, ART procedures before the uh, reserve has diminished too far. So you would be putting her on multiple cycles of clomiphene. At this point, if you find that her reserves are low, you would want to push her earlier into uh, ART procedures. So how about FSH, which was one we are all traditionally used to. So although FSH concentrations and dynamic tests like clomiphene uh, citrate challenge test have been used, their deficiencies are quite prominent and they have therefore been uh, overcome by the introduction of more informative biomarkers such as the antral follicle count by ultrasonography and the AMH or the anti-mullerian hormone. The improved performance of these two biomarkers is largely due to their significantly strong correlations with the primordial follicle counts. Therefore, although elevated FSH remains informative and continues to be a defining character of menopause, for assisted conception, its use is limited. So if we look at AMH, one of the advantages is that it can be measured on any day of the cycle. And throughout the cycle, there is not much variation. There will be little up and down, but most, uh, mostly it would be normal. Moreover, if you look at it across different cycles, it has been shown that it is a stable marker across four to five cycles. And its stability, if you can uh, compare with AFC, it is even higher than the antral follicle count. However, some things do affect the AMH. Long-term use of OCPs can reduce the AMH levels. Also, it is found to be lower in current smokers. So other than that, uh, it does not get affected by too many other factors. So that is why it's a stable and a very depend, uh, dependable biomarker. How about the antral follicle count? The problem is you got to measure it on the day two or day three, after which it will not be so useful. So as compared to AMH, here you are restricted by the time of the cycle. And also there could be variability when different and inexperienced sonographers perform the scan. Uh, of course, the sonography machines now are so advanced that the machine itself tells you in vaginal scan the number of follicles. So it is getting overcome by advance in technology. Therefore, uh, AFC and AMH dominates the clinical scene and they contribute and are synergistic. So underlying technologies like ultrasonography and better machines are developing rapidly and overcome the standardization issues that have limited their development to date. We all know that AMH has, the, has, has been a lot of problems with standardization and uh, the kits that are used. So even that is getting sorted out now. In IVF, their linear relationship together with the oocyte uh, relationship with the oocyte yield and thereby we can uh, figure out the extremes of ovarian reserve. Uh, therefore, this has resulted in improved pretreatment counseling where we know a poor responder can be advised that the count is going to be poor, otherwise she feels upset that I've spent such a lot of money on IVF and yet my results are poor. So counseling, it has uh, been a big benefit 
and also we can change our uh, stimulation strategies, increased cost, cost effectiveness and also enhance safety. We know the problem of ovarian hyperstimulation uh, and therefore we can avoid it if we use a combination of AFC and AMH. So it's like two faces of the moon. They exhibit strong and similar association with the size of the primordial follicle pool and the follicle recruitment rates. So which are the ones which are going to get recruited even if we give them gonadotrophins. So the strength of the relationship reflects that the same two to six mm follicles that are seen on ultrasound are the ones that produce anti-mullerian hormone. So the circulating AMH level reflects the output of all granulosa cells within the follicles and this production is not consistent and will reflect the size of the follicles, the potential granulosa cell mass, the state of maturation of the granulosa cells and also the intrafollicular environment. Also we know now that the genetics are involved where single nu nucleotide polymorphisms may potentially affect AMH production. So we are used to combining ultrasound and biochemical markers as we used to do in Down syndrome screening as gynecologists. So the basic phenotypic data like maternal age, the smoking status combined with ultrasound nuchal translucency and the biochemical ma markers provide a prediction model with best sensitivity and specificity. Similarly, by combining here age along with AMH and AFC, an optimal prediction can be achieved and a statistically significant increase in the area under the ROC from 0.8 to 0.85 if all three are used as compared to just two variables. So this gives us a prediction model. So uh, and why is this so important to predict the ovarian response? The unique strength of IVF is our ability to repeat the procedure with an inherent increase in the cumulative live birth rates. We know that the uh, IVF gives the results of 30 to 40 percent, which means more of them fail than actually succeed. So although majority will not get pregnant in the first cycle, with repeated attempts and combining multiple fresh and frozen cycles, the overall prospect of successful IVF outcome is quite good these days. We therefore need to avoid iatrogenic complications like OHSs and ensure that patients are counseled properly in case they are at a risk for OHSs and ensure that clinicians choose the optimum stimulation strategy even in the very first cycle. Because if you get an OHSs and the patient does not come for a uh, repeat cycle, then your cumulative pregnancy rate is not going to be good. So if the cumulative pregnancy rate has to be good, she needs to come forward for repeat cycles fresh or frozen. That if, uh, AFC and AMH can predict ovarian response accurately enables clinicians uh, to be informed about these critical steps and you could advise her that uh, because of her uh, risk of OHSs, we are going for a freeze all strategy, remove the uh, oocytes, make it into embryos, freeze everything, do not transfer in the same cycle and uh, that is how an OHSs free clinic could be run. So we need to identify these people who would go into such a problem or we need to identify the very poor responder where we can uh, advise her to go for donor cycles. So here you can see if you have AMH and AFC how you can change the cycle. So if you have very high risk of OHSs you can use an an uh, antagonist control and an agonist trigger so you can avoid the risk of OHSs and in these cases we would freeze all the embryos and transfer at a later date in the next cycle. If it is slightly lower you can use again an antagonist control and you could use HCG in these cases. In normal responders the long down regulation protocol with, protocol with agonist is useful and you can use HCG trigger here. In a reduced response you can use the agonist as well with higher doses of gonadotrophins. So this is how one can uh, stratify and change the protocols. So now we have spoken about IVF where AMH is currently being used. How about beyond ART? Is there any use? 
Non-reproductive medicine specialists, including gynecologists and many other people, measure FSH to assess the ovarian function as first line when a woman comes with menstrual irregularities. It, this is due to the fact that we are very used to FSH biological pathway during our undergraduate studies, as well as it's being widely available. It is automated, they are quite standard now, and they are available everywhere, as well as being cheap. However, there is much lower correlation with the primordial follicle counts and the follicle recruitment rates and has limited ability to actually diagnose PCO or ovarian dysfunction like premature ovarian failure. AMH would appear to overcome these shortcomings, particularly once the automation and competition make it available widely and it would become cheaper and therefore uh, it would be as popular as FSH. So this would open up AMH to all healthcare providers and will give a new and novel uses in the future where AMH will actually dominate over FSH. For example, in ovarian surgery, for a woman who is about to embark on an ovarian surgery, assessment pre-op and post-op will provide accurate estimates of the impact of surgery on ovarian reserve. We very often do uh, dermoids surgery on the ovary or um, endometriotic surgeries, and these can reduce her ovarian reserve. A recent meta-analysis quantified the number of uh, the impact of endometrioma removal as the reduction of AMH of 1.5 nanograms per ml, which is equivalent to almost a 10-year age-related decline. So when you, before you go in for surgery, this would be very useful. Also, we were used to doing the PCO puncture, which mostly has been given up these days. But even before that, if you have a AMH level, it would tell you that definitely uh, this is not the person where it's indicated or a very high AMH level where a PCO uh, patient where you could use it. How about a young woman with cancer? Considering future fertility is part of survivorship and life beyond the cancer. Discussing fertility preservation is now routine for oncologists and AMH therefore can better predict than age which woman will become infertile and or have chemotherapy related amenorrhea. So quantification of pretreatment ovarian reserve will facilitate counseling those women whose commencement of chemotherapy must be delayed to allow oocyte and embryo storage as they are already critically, uh, they have a low ovarian reserve. Even in prepubertal girls with cancer, AMH has been shown to be useful. Moreover, in, for, in the future oncology trials, AMH will be increasingly important for secondary outcome measure uh, that allows accurate quantification of the detrimental impact of certain strategies on the ovarian reserve. So uh, you can see that although right now it's at IVF that AMH is being used, there are so many other uses in the future where it would be useful. Uh, assessing in utero effects in the ovary perhaps, impact on childhood uh, disease, uh, addressing, um, uh, assessing the period irregularity, PCOS, etc. Uh, primary ovarian failure, uh, etc. Ovarian surgery, granulosa cell tumors, pre and post cancer treatment and also menopause and this would be very useful to, uh, for the family planning purpose in women who want to pursue career. So uh, a future where primary care physicians, endocrinologists and oncologists can rapidly assess ovarian function or dysfunction and the ovarian reserve more accurately than with the current FSH is an exciting possibility. For women, the ability to know the duration of their own reproductive lifespan will be empowering and allow them to redefine the meaning of family planning. Thank you for a patient listening.